Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones. Well, tonight in collaboration with the Melbourne Writers' Festival, Antidote at the Sydney Opera House and the Centre for Independent Studies, we're joined by the Dean of the Columbia School of Journalism in New York, Steve Cole, screenwriter, broadcaster and social media campaigner, Benjamin Law, American novelist, Lionel Shriver, Black Lives Matter and civil rights activist, DeRay McKesson, and the author of White Tears, Brown Scars, Australian journalist, Ruby Hammer. Please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Well, our first question comes from Ryan Smedley. Hi, Ryan. Hello. Thank you, panel. Lionel Shriver, in 2016 at the Brisbane Writers Festival, you spoke about the left's embrace of identity politics and gotcha hypersensitivity and that it led to the appeal of Trump for, quote, people who have had it up to their eyeballs with being told what they can and cannot say. Shortly afterwards, of course, he was then elected president. Do you think the liberal left, particularly in the United States, uh, has recognised and accepted that Trump's popularity can be partially attributed to a backlash to, against this tribalism based on group identity? Or has Trump's appalling behaviour over the past two and a half years only incensed the left to fight harder using the same tactics that failed them at the 2016 election? Lionel Shriver. Uh, there's something about the way you asked that question that I think you just answered it. Um, which is the latter, right? Um, one of the worst things uh, about the uh, Trump administration is the effect that it's had on the left. Uh, it hasn't sobered them up in the slightest and instead has driven um, the language to become ever more shrill. And I've actually found that the people who are the best commentators on Trump, who are opposed to him in every way, but do so with the greatest effica efficacy is uh, the folks who are moderate, in fact, understated, uh, who, who use dryness, a little drollness, a light touch, uh, reserve, uh, because that's what he can't fight. He thrives on, on invective. He thrives on name-calling. That's, that's what his idea of what politics is. And I'm afraid that the, the left, to a too great a, a degree, have fallen into that trap. And uh, in Fatally the, so, do you think, from their point of view, with the election coming up next year? Well, I, I think they have never taken any responsibility <coughs> for his election. Uh, uh, Mark Willa uh, did a, uh, an op-ed and subsequent little book, uh, which basically didn't completely blame the left for, for Trump, and I, I think that's simplistic. Uh, but they certainly uh, take some blame for um, being so extreme and so bossy uh, and, and so alienating, not just the right, but the center of the U.S., uh, that th they did help the Trump campaign along. Let's just go back to uh, that quote uh, of yours, um, Lionel. Uh, people have had it up to the eyeballs of being told what they can and cannot say, which is one of the reasons I think you think they turned to Trump. What is it they wanted to say that they couldn't? Well, of course, one of the main things that they were told they couldn't talk about is immigration. Um, and, and that is one of the reasons that Trump was elected. The suppression of a discussion about immigration, its pros and cons, uh, and, and it is one of the reasons that people got fed up because there was only there's only one standard view of immigration in the United States that's acceptable it's that it's the most wonderful thing in the world uh, and anyone who says that it, uh, even mass immigration uncontrolled illegal immigration that there's anything wrong with it whatsoever is a racist and that's just stopping the discussion at the get-go and uh, when you're repressive of that conversation. It actually drives people to more extremes. Let me go to uh, DeRay. What do you think? I mean, do you think the left have, in a sense, uh, let Trump off the hook, um, to take the last part of that question? 
No, you, you know, you think about the election, remember that more people voted against Trump than voted for him. So we can't forget that, that this is not this election that suddenly all these people came out and voted in droves for him at the cost of everybody else. More people voted against him. The other thing is that there's no way to talk about the election in 2016 without talking about voter suppression. It wasn't as if the left was just so volatile that people suddenly didn't vote. It was at the right, like, maniacally suppressed the vote. So what does it mean when they're purging a million votes in one state? What does it mean that they are knocking people off the rolls in such high numbers? Mm -hmm. So there's no way to talk about what happened in 2016 without talking about that. I don't blame the left for Trump. I am shocked. I think we all were shocked that the Trump voters existed long before Trump was there, that white nationalism, that white supremacy was really a voting base that people didn't think would vote like that, but they did. I sort of struggle with this idea that people can't talk about immigration. People have been talking about immigration for a long time. Mm. And when you think about what Trump is doing, it is sort of a dangerous idea to, to lump that all in this, uh, this notion of like mass immigration. Trump is literally putting kids in cages. That ICE now detains 55,000 people a day, more people detained in the history of ICE or any agency that's ever been like ICE. Uh, the Trump administration now is actually going to, they just passed a rule that's going to allow immigration judges uh, or that's going to allow the attorney general to make decisions on any case that's pending in immigration court. We've never seen that happen before, that they will actually be able to wipe out the cases at the, at the uh, attorney general level. That is like a wild thing. So I don't think it's that people couldn't talk about it. I do think that people believe that there should be a fair process, and that's not what we see today. Steve Cole, what do you think? Well, I mean, the Trump administration has invented a narrative about immigration that's obviously political and populist in character. It is familiar from American history, but it's not really aligned with what's uh, happening at the border. The rates of crossing during the Trump administration have, for the most part, been uh, down or normal compared to the decade before. What's different is the narrative of enforcement and detention and, uh, and, of course, the rhetorical effort to build a wall that even his own Republican Party won't fund. The Republican Party used to be a party of uh, seeking to win over the Latino vote in the United States, and often were able to win 40 or 45 percent of it. And President Trump's strategy is to go in a completely different direction. And that's what 2020 is going to be about. You see it now. It's very loud. It's very divisive. And it's only beginning. It's going to get a lot, a lot noisier. You heard... Lionel's view of the left and the way that they're playing uh, their card at the moment, it could actually lose them the election, in her view. What do you think? Look, the president is quite unpopular considering the economy is booming and we're basically at full employment. His, his approval ratings are about 40 percent, but those are, those are the kind of ratings that can win an election in our, in historically at this point in the cycle. The question is, who are the Democrats going to nominate and what issues are they going to run on? They took the House back in 2018 by nominating... Uh, for the most part in swing districts, military veterans, former intelligence officers, and in a very disciplined campaign, they went out there and they talked about health care, health care, health care, health care. I don't know whether the presidential campaign is going to be as disciplined and as focused on the so-called kitchen table issues that really drive uh, American voters who decide these elections, and certainly in the states that he flipped last time, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, yeah. Michigan. African-American turnout is absolutely critical in those states, but so are suburban women, and so are the issues that involve economic insecurity, and health care is at the heart of that. If the Democrats run on those issues as they, as they did in 2018, I think they've got a fighting chance. But I don't really see a candidate right now who's going to pull mm. all of that together. Uh, ben, pick up on the, the core of that question, mm. which was um, there's a sort of suppression of... Um, well, the, the idea in the question is a suppression of free speech. That is to say, identity politics somehow got in the way and a lot of people were very angry about that and voted for Trump as a result. Well, I think your question is really interesting because it can be applied to the Australian conversation, these notions of freedom of speech about identity politics. And if anything, what I'd like to do is tease out what we're actually talking about when we talk about identity politics, when we're talking about tribalism, because what some might perceive as tribalism, other people see as community. And what are the lines between of those between those two things um, when we talk about identity politics I mean uh, often I, I do find a lot of really valid conversation uh, dismissed as identity politics because their reactions to racism homophobia and sexism so at what point do you actually say well this is actually a valid conversation in response to things I mean 
I find myself talking about my race and my sexuality quite a bit. I don't particularly want to. I've got other things I would prefer to discuss and talk about, right? But sometimes I have to bring it up because it's, I feel it's been enforced on me. The same-sex marriage postal survey was a very clear example of that. That forced people to come out to talk about their sexuality, to talk about their gender identity, and often share stories that are incredibly painful just so people could see their humanity reflected in ours somehow. So there is, there is labour involved in that conversation. It's not that people necessarily always want to have it. Um, the, the idea of... Um, you, you brought up the word shrill as well. And I also wonder at what point does justified anger become shrill? I, these are questions I'm not sure I have the answers. Uh, Ruby, we'll hear from you and then we'll go on. Um, I'm really intrigued by this idea that it's the left that needs to take responsibility. I think absolutely the Democratic Party has to take some responsibility uh, for the campaign they ran and for the way they ran their primaries. Uh, you know, they're the, they're the losing side. But what are we talking about when we're talking about the left? And what are we talking about when we're talking uh, about not being able to say things? I think we're, we're skirting very politely around the issue, but I think what we're talking about is how are people of colour talking about racism making white people more racist and voting for a, a, a racist uh, president? Um, yeah. Um, so go ahead. Yeah, go just, on. Just, just to clarify, when I talk about identity politics, uh, it's perfectly acceptable I mean, uh, to refer to one's... Um, uh, hang on a sec. We're just getting a microphone to you. Just hang on for one second. Okay. Sorry about that. I was hearing you, but I'm sure the audience weren't. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Just, uh, just uh, when I refer to identity politics, uh, I think it's perfectly reasonable and acceptable when talking about sexuality and race uh, that, you know, it, it's, it's appropriate to bring that up. Uh, what concerns me about identity politics is that uh, we seem to be elevating the group identity uh, as the core of a person's argument as opposed to the ideas that are being raised. So what, what I often find is that if you're not female, you can't talk about female issues. If, you, if you're not on the autism spectrum, it would be inappropriate to have an opinion on uh, autism spectrum issues. I happen to be on the autism spectrum, so I just raise that. Um, yes, that's what, I, that's what I mean by identity. Okay, I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. I'm going to take that as a comment because you're sort of anticipating our next question, which I'll go to straight away, and it's from uh, Juliet Marchant. Thanks, Juliet. Um, in the midst of call-out culture, modern authors have become subject to proliferating prohibitions regarding the content of their fictional works, with one of the primary justifications for this censorship being that writers do not have the authority to represent perspectives that are not theirs. Does the battle between insensitivity and oversensitivity in the realm of fiction invite a greater attitude of ignorance and division by promoting the idea that we can never aptly empathise with a world that is not a mirror image of our own? Yeah, Lionel, this effectively is a subject of your speech tomorrow night, but yes. go ahead and, and uh, anticipate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, I, I have been very public on this point. Um, Fiction writers, their whole job is to try to imagine being different people. And therefore, to say that you, you are not allowed to project yourself into the minds of characters who have a different uh, race or uh, gender or uh, sexual preference th than your own is um, it's not only limiting for the author, it's also... Uh, means that the, the the fiction is going to be very narrow, and you know it's, it creates a kind of weird literary apartheid between two covers. Uh, it's antithetical to the whole nature of uh, the purpose of fiction, which, uh, aside from just to entertain, is also to to enlighten, to invite the reader into new worlds, into new experience, and I generally just unhappy with this whole attitude of, you know, the ownership of your culture and the protection of your, your experience and a kind of um, possessiveness about it. I, you know, none of us have very long on this earth and, you know, we need to share with each other as much as possible and that includes imaginatively projecting ourselves into each other's experience, whether that, that is as a reader or, or as a writer. Lionel, can I ask you, uh, where do you see the threat coming um, when you talk about this? I mean, uh, only yesterday, ahead of your speech, you warned about the dangers of cultural cowardice. 
uh, a fascistic movement bent on control and silence and obedience. I mean, what is that movement? Where is it coming from? The weird thing about I mean, a lot of it's coming from universities, but it's certainly spread into the mainstream culture. And I think that uh, one of the biggest problems is, is self-censorship. Uh, a lot of my colleagues are absorbing these made-up rules as if they are ironclad and have to be obeyed. Where are, the, where are the rules coming from, though? That's my point. It's no. something of a mystery. Mm. They seem to be um, emanating from universities, but also kind of sprouting up on social media. And I think the real problem is, uh, is letting people who invent these rules uh, dictate things. You don't have to take these rules seriously. They're not written in law, right? So ultimately, they're just suggestions that you can ignore. And I, I think it's important uh, to break down the barriers between people and cultures. After all, we've been uh, celebrating multiculturalism, multiculturalism for decades. Mm -hmm. So th this is really antithetical to that, uh, that movement, which was ultimately very productive. You know, it's, it's about a commingling rather than a separation. And that's my biggest problem with identity politics is the way that it, it divides people and, and separates people from each other and often pits groups of people against each other. So, uh, just before I move on to the other panellists, and I will um, pretty quickly, but, but you seem to be saying, be saying that the logical conclusion of this is the end of fiction, the end of the novel, um, and that all that would be available to a writer is memoir. Well, absolutely, because uh, I mean, uh, the groups that we're broken into seem to be getting narrower and narrower, and uh, uh, eventually, you know, if you take this to a logical conclusion, um, if I am not allowed to say write from a man's perspective or from a, an Australian's perspective, because I'm not Australian, eventually, you know, you narrow it down, then I'm I'm just writing about five foot two American women who were born in North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin Law, uh, what do you think? I mean, uh, so you, you've uh, you've written um, characters, you've written uh, uh, characters for your, fa your own family mm. uh, in the family law for television, but they're also characters who are not uh, Chinese Australian. Sure, absolutely. Um, I've written characters who. Um, you know, a white middle class women, that's not necessarily my experience. And I think I, I, on, on a, the very core of what you're saying, mm -hmm. I fundamentally agree with. It's not just the craft of a writer, mm -hmm. but also the obligation of a writer, especially a fiction writer, to extend that muscle of empathy, which is why we turn to fiction. We not only just turn to fiction to see <laughs> lives that aren't like ours, um, but lives that we can reflect ourselves in, even though we've got nothing in common with them, to share that humanity. That said, I have to say that part of this conversation needs to be contextualised as well because I, I, I'm guessing that um, part of what has galvanised you is hearing things like Lionel Shriver's speech at the Brisbane Writers' Festival, perhaps, um, and that speech was a really interesting one. Um, and I have to also declare up front, I'm, I'm a fan of a lot of Lionel's work, um, especially essays. We need to talk about Kevin is a really powerful piece of work. But the, Don't the, keep talking. The, <laughs> the, the, the speech itself, though, was interesting because in part, not wholly, it was res in a response to a Washington Post review to, to one of your novels. And that review wasn't necessarily about cultural appropriation. That reviewer felt that you had uh, written a character poorly, you, a, a character of colour. You know, one of the, one of the um, reasons I resorted to that um, was just to fill out the speech. <laughs> um, and, and let me explain. Uh, there were very few examples at that time, this was in 2016, of the cultural appropriation taboo being applied to fiction. And one of the things that's very interesting to me coming back here three years later is how broadly it has been applied to fiction in the years since. So I was just basically desperate for <laughs> some kind of example. The, the cultural appropriation conversation is an important one, though, because I think it was separate in, in terms of the response of what the Washington Post was pointing about, out in your work. Mm. The whole conversation about cultural appropriation exists because it acknowledges that there's been a long history in performance, in television, in literature, basically across the arts, where people have been spoken about but not engaged in the work, where people have been marginalised within publishing 
on the stage in playwriting and instead felt their work, had their stories represented by other people. Um, and that is kind of a form of historical erasure and dehumanising. So I, I'm not of the camp where I say you shouldn't write about people mm -hmm. who aren't you. What I am saying is that we need to be cognisant of the history. Uh, we need to be cognisant of racist tropes of blackface, of yellowface, of minstrel shows, because that was the very kind of original sins that spurred this conversation in the okay, first place. And, and, and I'm, there's I'm, an opportunity... I know, but I need to throw around to the rest of the panel. And uh, let's hear from DeRay, uh, first of all. Uh, listen to this. I mean, I actually went back and had a look at a, a Toni Morrison interview recently, and you know, sadly departed Nobel Prize winner, and she said, I can write about white people, white people can write about black people, anything can happen in a novel, there are no boundaries there. Uh, do you agree with that general proposition? And I think Tony is an incredible artist and it is sad that she is gone. Uh, I think that the spirit of that is right, and I think that what Ben said is true, is that we are reminding people that the history of publishing is white people telling stories about everybody. That is what publishing was for so long. And it was white authors saying that they were the most authoritative and the most able to write about everybody's culture. And I think that this response now is saying, you know what, people are smart enough to write about themselves, that we trust people to write their own narratives and their own stories, and that we want to empower people to write not only understanding identity as an intellectual exercise, like I'm intellectually sort of inhabiting this other experience, but like I know it because I lived it, right? I think that that is like where this thrust comes from. And I do think that there's a difference between appropriation and appreciation. That appropriation is about exploitation. It is about centering your own experience as you inhabit another body or another life. Appreciation is saying, hey, I'm learning in this moment too. I'm like growing and I'm pushing myself as I explore something else, right? And I think that that is sort of the challenge that we see. So when we think about identity politics, even back to you, is that we'd say that all politics is identity politics, that there's no way that you engage in what power looks like without thinking about yourself as a man or somebody who has a range of identities, that that is like actually what it is, that when we hear people criticize identity politics, what we hear is sort of a dog whistle and a command. We hear people saying that like, it's not that identity doesn't matter, but it's that any identity that's not mine doesn't matter. That is what we hear when we hear that phrase. Because there's no way that you do not enter into conversations mindful of the way that like your lived experiences factor into the world around you. Yeah, that's interesting because, uh, in fact, what Toni Morrison said, what made her really mad was when critics said, oh, you should stop just writing about black people. Right. You should write about white people too. And, in fact, you should write about the confrontation between black and white people. That's the real subject you should be writing about. It made her really mad well, because she wanted to write about her lived experience. And what Toni says too in other writings is she's like, I'm, she's like, black people are the best people to write about white people because we had to survive all of them, right? That, like, that is what <laughs> Toni... Toni is like, we had to raise your kids, we... <laughs> We like built the country. We did all of it, so we are able. At, we are more able to write about all of you because we had to survive, right? Yeah. Like that is sort of Tony's experience too. And I think that there is something to that again. That like there are writers who can inhabit other lives as an intellectual experience. But at a point, I don't want you to write about a gay black man as an intellectual experience. I want to hear somebody who lived it write this story. And this isn't to say that other people cannot, but it is about acknowledging that legacy. That it is only white authors who feel the authority to write about everybody else's culture as if they are the voice. I'm just going to quickly go back to Lionel just to respond to that. Um, what, do you, what do you think? That's a, that's a fair point, isn't it? I think it's important to distinguish uh, the cultural appropriation conversation from the diversity one, and, and that is uh, little by little publishing has become more inclusive and has uh, broadened both the audience and the, the authors that, that it promotes, and that's all to the good, that it, everyone benefits from that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and therefore, we don't, we don't have to defend each other's experience. We can just trade information. And uh, so sometimes this, this, this conversation is misinterpreted as, as uh, preserving the r white privilege to uh, butt into your business. Um, but it's more that I want us all to butt into each other's business, and I am very pleased that publishing is becoming. Well, I've got, I've got, to, I've, I've got to ask you. I've got to ask you. Privilege in quotes. Privilege is white privilege is. Real, it's just so. a word I'm really tired of. <laughs> but I've got to ask you. I'm tired um, of racism. Are, are, are you are yeah. you so provoked? Are you so provoked by the idea that you shouldn't do it? Uh, that you're going to put more 
um, let's say, people of colour into your novels? Well, um, my new novel has uh, two uh, secondary black characters and I'm not sure I did it exactly to defy my critics, but I certainly didn't stop myself, <laughs> right? And, you know, I included these characters because they were an important part of my story and that they needed to be black for a reason. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you what happens. <laughs> uh, but but I d it was interesting having to overcome a little interior reluctance, a little, uh-oh, you're going to get yourself into trouble. <laughs> because right now, just because of this conversation and, and the sensitivities of the time, any white uh, novelist who includes uh, characters of other races is aware that those characters are going to be subject to super scrutiny. But and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not in time. No, of course it isn't. But it it does create, I, I think for a lot of my colleagues, it creates such reluctance that, that they may think better of it. Again, See, Ben, I'm going to just pause you for a moment because I want to hear from Ruby. Mm -hmm. um, What's your perspective? Well, firstly, I concur with uh, all, all have spoken so far that... Uh, you don't have to belong, or I don't think you have to belong and be part of a certain group to be able to say something or, or, or try to write from from that perspective. I do think there should, there needs to be a, a, a respect for the power of representation. And yes, uh, white people have had you know, centuries of being, as, as you said, the, the voice and speaking for and about everyone else. And, but when I say the respect for the power of representation is that those representations served a purpose. It, it, it wasn't just for the fun of it. It wasn't just because they could do it. It was part of the way in which power dominates and controls. So angry, you know, black women were represented and still are as angry because it's a way of invalidating their opinions, invalidating their arguments, invalidating their oppression because if, she, if a black woman, and this now applies to brown women as well, is to get angry at the way she's been treated. And anger is a very healthy response to sustained mistreatment. But because it's considered an intrinsic part of her, it's completely invalidated. Well, that's just her being her normal, irrational, angry self. We don't need to listen to her, which, of course, is going to make her more angry. Um, so this is what I mean, and, and uh, you know, the power of representation. Now, I'll ju just give a really quick example. Uh, I think it was in 1929, you can fact-check this later, that the Mexican government issued an embargo on New West cultural products that contained representations of, of Mexicans and other Latin Americans because the representations were so derogatory, depicting you know, Mexicans as criminals, as uncouth, uh, Mexican women as, you know, sirens and, you know, easy and with no, you know, promiscuous with no morals. So these, these, were, they, these were just so dominant in, in the films and in, you know, pop, pop culture that, that there was just this total embargo because that, that was all part of the, the, the domination, the, con, the control of, uh, you know, of, of Mexico in, in the wake of the, the Mexican... Um, and uh, American law. Okay, just to bring you to the point, uh, do you have any objection to uh, a white writer like Lionel Shriver uh, writing black characters in her novel? In a one-word answer, no. What I, what I have... Let's stop uh, there. Objection. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do... You know, this is a good opportunity because the, the, the criticism of, of, of Lionel's character was that it was a... A, a black woman who ended up, you know, losing her her, her, her mind, getting getting dementia, and she was put on a leash by her white husband's family, and they dragged her around on a leash. Now, well, I, have you read the book? Well, I, well, I was using. Oh, I was. No, I have not. I have read two of your novels. That's okay, not one well, of them. But I got this from your. I, I got this from your speech. But that, I did get this from your. Trans that was script. taken out of context, and in these circumstances, mm -hmm. I dare say you would have put her on a leash too. It was. For but her fair enough. Good. If you think, if you if black women lived and white people as well lived in a, a, a vacuum devoid of context, but the context is 
400 years of slavery and then segregation and lynching. And no, the, I, I would the, like the context to, was like chapter 12. No, but the con <laughs> I, I mean the context, the cultural and the social and political context in which you wrote your novel and you wrote this character. Now we are we are all in ways we don't realize we are impacted by our environment we are impacted by this history and and these centuries of, of representations and of violence but ruby can and i just so say can, ruby can i just give you a counter mm -hmm. example i mean the sure. handmaiden's tale um is a book about women who belong to a certain caste mm -hmm. who are only there to create children for the upper caste in the society so i don't think anyone is saying of the author um you shouldn't do that because that demeans women they're actually saying Oh my God! This is a uh, this this reflects on our society okay, today. Okay, so, so I'll, could you not conceive of that? I can um, happening conceive of it. So I'll ask, I will ask Lionel. Was that your intention? Were you attempting to to draw or to highlight the way in which black women and black people have been degraded and the violence that has been? No, at this well, particular point in the novel. It didn't matter that she was black. What mattered was that she was demented. She didn't know where she was. She would wander off. The family has been cast out of their house. New York City is falling apart. They are going to an encampment in uh, Prospect Park, and they need to be able to control her for her own good, or she's just going to disappear and probably be murdered. But why? Why? Okay, uh, you know what? I, I think we could get okay. very, very deep into the plot, and that might. Does be that a make you want to read the book? <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad way to try and sell your book on a program like this, but actually I'm going to move on um, because we've got questions across a range of subjects. Uh, the next one's from James Rongenhall. Um, my question is for Steve Cole. Steve, how do you see an independent professional press remaining relevant in a context of media fragmentation, social media, polarisation on the basis of political and social beliefs and increasingly blurred lines between news and opinion? That's a good question. I think the most powerful answer is to keep doing investigative reporting that changes uh, societies and that exposes corruption and causes ministers who are abusing their power to resign. Uh, that's the hardcore of journalism that distinguishes it from uh, opinion and essay. Uh, it's reporting. It's about getting to the bottom of things, using public records, using interviews, accessing whistleblowers, being the court of last resort for people who's, uh, who have been failed by their institutions. Uh, you know, obviously the press in the United States is under assault by the president who calls us enemies of the people and it's created an atmosphere of incitement uh, that is very disturbing. But at the Has that accelerated the disintegration of, or the fragmentation that we're talking about? It's actually strengthened the press. It's strengthened uh, Certainly the New York rooms. Times. It's that's certainly, obviously yeah, the Washington Post. <laughs> it's strengthened uh, students at Columbia Journalism School, everybody has a sense of purpose. They know why we're in the public square and what our job is. Uh, and I think, you know, for all of the attacks on the press in the US uh, and in some ways globally, we're in a renaissance of investigative reporting. Yeah. The Me Too movement wouldn't have happened without investigative reporting. Think about the abuses in the Catholic Church that required journalists because institutions failed, the prosecutors failed, the police failed, and journalism stepped in, listened, verified, published, and things changed. So that is where, and that credibility in, in our country, despite the polarization, which is very severe, it's working in red states as well as in blue states because people want power held to account. They want abuses stopped. And, and a free press is, a, is an indispensable part of that, of that system. Ben, what do you think? Um, I think it's a... It's a really good thing to bring up. I mean, the, 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 the whole idea of Trump actually going out attacking the press, I mean, it really does feel like the first steps towards an autocratic regime. When you start calling journal journalists enemies of, of the state, I mean, that should send chills down your spine, but I guess Trump has said so many things by now. He's really kind of drilling complacency into people. And just building on what you've said before, in, in the Australian context, I think, you know, we, we largely, um, I think surveys have shown that we largely distrust politicians, understandable. Um, but there is sort of a growing distrust of, of the media in some quarters as well. But I ha would impress on you all that the media in Australia is diversifying and quite strong. And what happened with, say, Cardinal Pell wouldn't have happened if it weren't for journalists like Louise Milligan. Um, we, are, we are lucky to have that mechanism here. Steve, is it 
clearly going in the direction of strengthening the media. I mean, the digital um, platforms are obviously changing everything, but we do see with the New York Times, which has become Im immeasurably strengthened in many respects, has moved into the digital space very cleverly. Well, there's an enormous economic disruption that has damaged newsrooms across the country. It's, it's uh, most damaging in the heartland of the country where voters... Um, are left without professional newsrooms reporting on their local governments, on their state capitals, where you know I imagine there's a golden age of corruption that we don't even know about in some of these places. We have news deserts opening up in our country because of the collapse of the local news business model that used to be based in newspapers. On the coasts, at, at the national news outlets like the Times and the, and the Post, the digital revolution has started to become rewarding. Subscribers are engaging and paying for the news. And, those newsrooms are actually growing substantially. But it's, it's uh, unhealthy in that it's located uh, on the two coasts and, and not in the heart of the country. Mm. Um, I, there may be a way for local news organizations to uh, copy some of the strategies that the Times and Post have succeeded with, but we're nowhere near uh, stabilization, never mind growing back into strength. Uh, Duray, how does this look to you? Um, Black Lives Matter obviously requires um, public attention. Um, how does the media play into the whole protest movement that grew up um, from that, uh, from the early days? Yeah, so let me preface by saying I, I agree that the media is stronger and more important than it's been in a long time. I will say that the media was slow to call a spade a spade. They <laughs> trumped it a whole lot before they were like, this is racist. It's like, the kids in cages wasn't racist? You're like, what does it take for you to be like, I think this is racism, you know? And people really played. They played with Trump and they let him get away with a lot before it really got serious. And I also think that they entertained this idea of both sides for a long time. So when Trump is like, you know, in Charlottesville, he's like, oh, it's good people on both sides. The news sort of just kept reporting that as like, oh, well, the president said it. You're like, well, uh, I think that the people with tiki torches, I don't think they were good guys. You know, like, I think that this is sort of an easy call to make. And now the press is like a little more hardline. So the ticker tapes on CNN are like, Trump is lying about these five things he's saying. And you're like, mm. finally, you know, like, you knew that wasn't true, but it took him a long time to get there. And that is really like, I, we can't not call that out. And I would fight with reporters all the time because they would do both sides around issues of race, but when somebody walked into a newsroom and killed uh, newspaper people in Annapolis, when they like walked, somebody walked in and threatened newspaper people, killed them, the news didn't participate in both sides. They didn't. They didn't put anybody who believed that the news was the enemy. Those people weren't on TV. They weren't getting profiles. But the alt-right who believed in white supremacy, they were getting these full glamour shot features. And the reason that the news didn't have the people who walked into a newsroom and killed people on TV is that they understood that playing both sides for those people actually created dangerous environments. And it was sad that it, they did not have that same energy around issues of race. With the movement... I was uh, going to say, did the media get it in when th these protests started uh, or got really big in Ferguson um, back in, I think, 2014? 2014, yeah. Um, did, uh, and you've got a, Obama as a president then. Um, what happened? Did the media understand what this was all about or was it such a confined area uh, where it was happening that they didn't really see the core of it? I think that in the States, the media is a little slow about race in general. So they were slow then. Uh, thankfully, we had Twitter and Twitter was really important to us. And if not for Twitter, uh, Missouri would have tried to convince you that we didn't exist. We were in the street for a long time, for 400 days. And in the beginning... Tell us how many people we're talking about, because they were, these were big protests. Yeah, yeah. So and they were like... violent from the police perspective. I mean, the police used armoured vehicles. They used tear yeah, gas. The police they were used... violent. Yeah, uh, we were that's, no, that's what I'm saying. OK, I was like, we weren't violent. The police mm. were violent. <laughs> uh, the police were violent. Is that the, we were only in the street because the police killed people. That, we were in the street for 400 days. It was a long 400 days. Uh, but again, if not for Twitter, Missouri would have convinced you that we didn't exist. They declared a no-fly zone almost immediately uh, over Missouri, so you didn't see any aerial footage of those protests. Uh, they killed Mike Brown on August 9th and 10 people uh, very quickly thereafter. They killed another kid nine days later. You know, it was really wild. And we think about the issue in the States, a third of all the people killed by a stranger in the United States is actually killed by a police officer. So it is bad. And people say to me all the time, why am I making this about race? And I remind them that race is making this about me, that I didn't do this, right? That we're in the street because we had to be. But with Twitter, uh, it was really important. And you think about 2014, it feels like so long ago, is that in 2014, there was no Twitter video. There was no live streaming. There was no... Uh, Periscope, there was no Facebook Live. Like, we were literally using Vine and making these six second video clips and putting them on the internet. You know, like, that was how we mobilized thousands of people. But the media sort of picked up, and I'll tell you, you know, Don Lemon, who is on CNN, 
there were a lot of reporters who said we were being dramatic. They're like, you know, you're being dramatic about the tear gas, and then they got tear gassed, and it was great, because it was like, well, <laughs> told you they were tear gassing people, and you thought we were being dramatic. And, you know, the day Don Lemon got tear gassed, it was one of those, like, we tried to tell you they were tear gassing people and didn't care. <laughs> and it was like, it took that. You know, you think about Chris Hayes, his show started right when the protest started. Mm. And in St. Louis, we, it was illegal to stand still in August, September, and October. We stood still from- Illegal August. to stand still. Maybe Meaning, when you're in the street, you have to keep moving all the time. All the time. So if you saw us marching, it wasn't that we thought marching was cool. We had to. Uh, and if you stood still for more than five seconds, you were arrested. And everybody. So the reporters, we forced the reporters to walk to. The police would let the reporters stand still. And we're like, nope, if we out here, y'all out here. And I'll never forget Chris Hayes in his early, early in his career. You know, he was out there. And I remember somebody going up to him and cussing him out, being like, you don't get to write about us and not walk, because we had to walk all day long and all night. And it really was that energy that changed everything. You know, this is the first year ever in the country where black people are more afraid of being killed by a police officer than being killed by community violence. Uh, and the police have actually killed more people since the protests, not less. So it has been a hard going, but the media was slow. I, and I just want to have one other sort of key question for you about this, because we were talking about the the kind of violence of society generally, about racism and the pressure that it puts people under. And I'm thinking about you at the core of this demonstration. And the death threats started very early. Have they kept going? How many death threats have you had? And what is your life like having to live with this constant fear that someone's going to kill you? Try not to count them. Uh, so uh, don't do that. But. You know, movie theater was evacuated because somebody said they were going to kill me. The first person ever permanently banned from Twitter was banned for raising money to try and get me killed. Uh, my phone got hacked. So just like Jack Dorsey's, uh, if you saw Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, his Twitter account got hacked. It was a SIM swap. So somebody called, the same thing happened to me. Somebody called Verizon, the phone company, posed as me. My social security number was dumped on the internet. Uh, they got my SIM card changed over the phone, which I didn't even know you could do. And then they reset all my passwords and logged into the account. I've been sued by five police officers in two states. Uh, and I have one pending case at the Fifth Circuit because they are saying that this officer got hit by a rock one night where I was outside, and they're saying that I can be held civilly responsible for that. Now, the, I say all this to say that, like, the reason I still do this is I think we'll win, and I know that those people want us to be too afraid to do the work. Like, the goal is to make us too afraid to come outside again. Uh, but again, a third of all the people killed by strain in the United States is killed by a police officer. That is why, like, that should shock people. That is, like, a wild thing, you know? So we spend a lot of time on the laws. Like, in California, there's a law that says that any investigation of an officer that lasts more than a year can never result in discipline regardless of the outcome. Those things don't make sense. Okay, um, thank you for that. And um, I'm going to move on because we've got, as I said, quite a few. Well, here's violence from another perspective, in fact. It's a video from Tim Dale in Canberra. The protests in Hong Kong have now been going on for three months. With the police response becoming increasingly violent and the protests spreading to countries like Australia, is the government going to stand up for human rights and condemn the Hong Kong government and call for free and fair elections? If not, okay. does the panel believe we are now too reliant on trade with China to stand up for its human rights abuses, both on the mainland and in Hong Kong? Benjamin, sorry, I jumped the gun there. Benjamin, uh, we'll start with you. Yeah, this is, this is kind of a personal question for me because mm. my, my family's in Hong Kong, my cousins, my aunties, my uncles, and I think when we watch the footage... Um, on the news, uh, sometimes Australians can feel like it's a bit of a remote issue over there. But it's very much an Australian issue, just as the questioner said, because it is coming to Australia. Uh, we are seeing violence play out on university campuses. We are seeing art galleries uh, uh, cancel events that uh, showcase Chinese artists um, and dissidents uh, without giving much of an explanation. Um, we've got an Australian citizen who's currently detained by China. Um, and what's been really upsetting is that that particular writer, Yang Hen Jun, was told by an investigations officer when he was being interrogated um, that Australia was dependent on China for its trade and economy. And Canberra won't help you, let alone rescue you. And when I hear that, I wonder if that's right. And that's something that I think Australians are going to have to confront. We're going to have to have a lot more nuance in our conversation about China. We have to understand the differences between Hong Kong, China, Taiwan. We have to understand the communist, uh, the, the People's Communist Party um, of China. Uh, we've seen just before Q&A the brutality with which police are 
acting on protesters. Um, these are, you know, they are beating up civilians just catching the train, sometimes indiscriminately. And because Australia's economy is so married to China and has arguably, our whole story has been married to China for over 200 years now, we have to kind of now question the terms on which that marriage continues, I think. I'll just hear from the other Australian on the panel, Ruby. Mm. Um, you know, I agree. Some the, 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 the images are shocking, but what I... Well, I get concerned about when... We, said we have this um, idea that we have to say something, we have to do something, put you know, our, our trade aside and stand up for human rights. But how much is our condemnation going to be worth? And if we can step back a little and see ourselves maybe from China's perspective, and I'm not, I'm not you know, going to equate our own human rights abuses are, are, are on the same level necessarily, although and sometimes they can be comparable um, given the history, the colonial history of this country. But you know, is, is China going to necessarily listen and, and think that we have a, the, the moral high ground given, you know, how the Indigenous population is still treated in incarceration rates. You know, there's, there's an inquest all of you know, last week on, on going into the death of an Aboriginal woman in custody, you know, arrested for uh, public drunkenness, allegedly, given the way in which we sequester um, asylum seekers on in offshore detention as if they are a literal contagion to our society that we have to be protected from these these threats to our way of life you know how much is our condemnation worth uh, in that sense why would another government think that we you know should be listened to because we're setting such a fine example and again i'm not saying it's all exactly the same there are obviously nuances there but we you know, that's just what I think we, we have to sometimes see ourselves from other people's eyes. But I, I don't think the problem is really a question of moral authority. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much more pragmatic than that. Yeah. So, uh, I Australia, agree, but Australia it's a and, yeah? and, and other countries, of course, mm. uh, would have to uh, hurt China in a practical way. Uh, I think they're perfectly capable of ignoring uh, moral criticism. They've certainly, mm. you know, with the Uyghurs, they've been ignoring up a storm. There's been plenty of press about that issue. And uh, they don't care. You'd have to hurt them economically. But how, how can we hurt... And that, would, that entails making real sacrifices. And I think, I think that Hong Kong has the capacity to become a real test of the West. Because if there is another uh, Tiananmen Square style event there, what are we going to do? And, uh, you know, I anticipate probably kind of nothing. Because we're, too, uh, we're already too integrated with China, too dependent on China. China has so much U.S. debt. Um, you, would, you would have to be able to be, make real economic sacrifices on, on your own behalf. And, and I, I wonder. Ben, I'm going to come back to you. Dorea, I want to hear from your perspective. I'm looking at these protesters in, uh, in Hong Kong. You must feel some sort of sympathy, um, given what you've been through. But, I mean, how does it look? Um, I mean, they're having to carry umbrellas because of overhead surveillance cameras cover their faces because they're terrified of being identified by the Chinese security services. Um, the protesters themselves are getting a little more violent but the response to them is getting much more violent. Yeah, not, even, not necessarily sympathy as much as solidarity. Shout out to the protesters. And I think that people aren't even talking about the scale. Two million people out of roughly seven million people is a lot of people. I mean, that is, that's a lot of people in the street. <laughs> so when you think about like the sheer scale of what it means at two million, you know, I was talking to one of the organizers yesterday and I'm like, how did you move two million people? Like, what, I'm just like fascinated by the strategy. Moving two million people is a lot of people, you know? Uh, so I think that that is like really impressive. I do think countries can step in and say we're watching. And I don't think that that is small. I think about like what it meant for our, us in St. Louis that people, other like amnesty came down and it really put the government on edge to know that people were collecting data and collecting evidence. And they 
have been genius. So I don't know if you saw that the police are using, put blue dye in the water cannons mm -hmm. to mark the protesters. And the protesters were like, prepare for it, had different changes of clothes, like where they were just ready, you know? And you're like, yes, this is great. And uh, tear gas, if you've ever been tear gas, tear gas, uh, hopefully you've not been tear gas, but uh, tear gas canisters are very hot. So they are, they're just hot. And what they're doing that's also really brilliant is that they have people whose role is to just pour water on the canisters. Like the moment the canister hits the ground, they pour water on it and it just dissipates, the, and you're like, that is brilliant. So mm. if anything, I'm proud of them, and I'm just in awe. I was talking to an organizer, and I asked what was the difference with this protest, and she said that Facebook Live has been the difference, that there are older people in Hong Kong who for the first time see it happening in real time, mm. and they are like, this is real, because everything they'd seen before had been heavily edited. Mm. But two million out of seven million, to me, is a win. Like, that is mm. a lot of people. Uh, I'm gonna go to Steve, um, of course, uh, on the mainland, um, they're not getting anywhere near that kind of coverage. Facebook Live does not exist there. They're not getting live feeds unless they've got some way of getting around uh, the Great Wall of China, as they call it. The, but so how, what, what are the unique problems for reporters in China at the moment? Well, they just threw out a uh, Wall Street Journal reporter for writing about a family member of uh, the president. and. Um, they keep reporters on renewable visas that are that are essentially a form of uh, coercion. Uh, usually, I think a year at a time. I had a friend of mine was thrown out for reporting on the Uyghurs, essentially just non-renewed. It's hard to really absorb from the outside how far the workarounds of the firewall extend to the Chinese population. Certainly, in the cities, sophisticated Chinese know how to work around it, but. Um, Look, I think what's extraordinary about this is uh, the resilience and the breadth of this protest. Uh, we've been covering in uh, protests in Hong Kong periodically for a number of years now, but the, the determination, the resilience, the risk-taking, the, and, and the strength of this protest, I, it's one of the most extraordinary events in the world right now. And I do think it's right that uh, a very easy and and yet meaningful response for Western governments is to tell China we're watching and that if you do go in, uh, you're gonna pay a price. And it may be right to be cynical about what price would actually be paid if they did, but the warning is still effective right now. China wants to take advantage of the American retreat from the world under the Trump administration. It wants to be credible across the globe with uh, the entire membership of the United Nations. And so they, that's part of why they're kind of self-restrained right now, I think, is that they, they don't want to have to pay the price in global opinion. We should raise that price as high as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we've got another question uh, sort of on this subject from Kingsley Lou. Kingsley. Australian Chinese arrived uh, four generations ago on the gold fields, and that's 150 years of history. Then Southeast Asians came in the 80s, and mainland Chinese flowed in over the past 20 years. Out of the one million here already, where does the truer loyalties lie? Has mainstream media created doubt? Benjamin. That's a really good question. And in fact, Chinese Australian history goes back even further. The first Chinese documented immigrant to come to this country arrived 201 years ago. There were indentured labours before the gold rush. And in fact, there were Chinese market forces at play that drove Australia's first taste of globalisation through a trade of sea cucumber through Arnhem Land with um, Macassans in Ind Indonesia. The Chinese influence and presence in this country has been going on for such a long time, which is why I find it so interesting where I'm sure you, people like me, are constantly still asked, where do we come from and do you feel more Chinese or more Australian? Your question, your, your loyalties are always questioned, I think, more to the extent than, say, you know, a second generation German immigrant to this country. You go up to Darwin, you go to far north Queensland, you get even thicker accents like mine up there with a the Chinese face too. We've been part of the tapestry for so long. One of the reasons why we made um, this two-part documentary series for the ABC was to reframe not just Chinese Australian history, but Australian history. Chinese history has always been at the core of this nation. But you're absolutely right, whether it's uh, uh, interference with the real estate market or um, <laughs> interference with the baby milk formula market or anything else. Suspicion is always cast on us, even though you can't um, go and participate in an Australian yeah, so auction ben, without being a resident. Do you feel that is a real thing? Um, the question's been raised, but do you feel that is real? 
We, I mean, when, I, when we made the documentary, what was interesting to me was that I realised that I was born in this uh, sweet spot slash warm patch between uh, quite a long period of anti-Chinese xenophobia, especially the white Australia policy, the policy that really thrusted this country into federation was because of a fear of the Chinese specifically. And that white Australia policy right, it lasted right up essentially until the mid-1970s. I came along in the 1980s and then by the time I go to high school, Pauline Hanson is out there um, saying that I don't assimilate to this country and I form gangs, which sounds kind of cool, but I never really got to that point. <laughs> so we've had a long history of anti-Asian racism and I think that does account for why our loyalties are still questioned in this country. Um, I'm going to leave it with you, that one, because we've got another question. Uh, this one is from uh, Lamia Rahman. Thank you. Um, so my question is to Ruby. Uh, white woman um, being agents of white supremacy and settler colonialism has been well documented in the USA with white women making up a large majority of Trump supporter base. But how has this idea of white womanhood manifested in contemporary Australia? And how can we talk about something like that without ignoring the fact that most women of color are also settlers you know, living here on unceded Aboriginal land. Yeah. Ruby. Oh, thank you. Um, good two-part question. Um, so I think why the first part is you know, why womanhood has I think, manifested here uh, in a very similar way to the US. We, you know, different but similar uh, origins as European settler colonies and uh, white women in, in all that time were... Subordinated, subordinated to white men, but yet they're white, so they're part of the privileged class um, or the dominant, the ruling class. So they've played the, they, this this um, this kind of dual role where they were held up as, you know, these these paragons of, of of virtue and innocence that had to be protected and protected from the indigenous and enslaved populations, and and yet uh, at the same time kind of incapable of ruling because they're not on, up on the same level uh, as as white men. And yeah, obviously um, since that time there's been white women who've resisted that that um, that framing of themselves. There's been white women that have have taken it on. If you want to look in the Australian context, uh, you know, obviously easiest example. You, you know. We're, <laughs> Pauline Hanson, I think, plays that sort of that role very uh, that role very well, where she flips between being a victim, um, you know, who's always you know having to deal with so much from 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 the men in her party that she hires, and <laughs> and then and then to to being quiet, you know, forceful um, and, uh, and and angry, and so and that sort and then obviously that sort of manifests in, in all sort of different. Uh, strata of society. Can I, and can I try and boil down yes, your please argument? Please do. Uh, yes. Are you, so, uh, <laughs> are you, are are you making the case that that white women in colonial societies in Australia, the United States, and other places have been let off the hook by history? That the yes. men have been blamed for all the bad things, but you're you seem to be claiming yeah. that the white women in these societies are not equally to blame, but heavily to blame. Yeah, I, I'm. Look, you know the. Saying let off the hook, you know, I mean, it, that's a, it's a really strong way of putting it. I know that was in the title of the article I wrote, but I, I didn't write the title. <laughs> um, so, but what I what I'm trying to say is that we need to really interrogate the, that history and the way in which the history still impacts us today, in order to understand not only the oppression of of women of colour and all people of colour, but also why white women seem to be making gains in some arenas and not in others. And you know the first thing, uh, uh, what, what, well, what, what sort of sprang to, to my mind because in the research of writing this book is that violence against women is not decreasing. So you would think that as white women are getting more power, they're more representation, that that would sort of you know even out all across the board, that, that their lives would improve in all in, in all areas. But, but doesn't doesn't that rather not. suggest the feminist argument, the the discourse around? Uh, women being chattels, women being, in, particularly in colonial no, time, I, I, women being forced into a situation is, no, I, is closer to the mark. I don't, I don't no. think that they were... Uh, I, I think it's quite... Uh, 
it's quite disrespectful, particularly of, of, of black women in America and, and indigenous women here to say that white women were chattels in the same way and degraded and, and uh, in, the, in quite the same way that, that, that women, as black women were um, because white women didn't have the choice whether to come here or not. They did come, they did, they did come and, and settle and they had a lot more freedom. You didn't have a choice freedom. if you came here as a prisoner or a convict. Uh, absolutely not. But of course, you know, we, 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 we're talking about groups and we're talking about history. There's always exceptions, there's always nuances. Uh, as, in, as a ruling class, white women had choice and a, and a certain level of autonomy that was not available to either uh, men of colour, black men, indigenous men, and especially not to, to women uh, of colour. And, uh, and so and now I've lost sort of the, the train of my thought. But I, I, I want to get I to the second part yeah. of the question. But what I do want to say is, is what I, you know, one of the sort of the big eye-openers for me in, in, in the research that I did in this book is I think a big massive part of the reason why white women are still not believed when they talk about their experiences of sexual assault and of violence at the hands at the hands of white men is that throughout history white women it's in history where white women have been regarded as a protected class to be protected only from men of color only from the sexual deviancy of of black men and then when okay. settlers came brown men the second part of your question sorry Ruby, I, think Ruby, I, I think it's very important well, I do it, it might be but we're going to run out of time so I'm so hear, sorry. I do want to hear other perspectives on... Uh, and you were about to jump in, Lionel. So. Oh, I was just going to say I, I am hoping mm -hmm. that uh, it is not your purpose to set in the modern day uh, white women against minority women uh, and, and, and in a contest of who's been more oppressed. Or uh, That's, that's my, one of my main problems with this way of thinking, the identity politics thing is is that kind of rivalry which i don't think uh, we didn't create it, the in rivalry in which anybody Lionel. wins no this is very important and i know i'm, I'm sorry to to take up other people's time but i can't let that stand if there's a rivalry, if there's a division in feminism, if there's a division in our society, it's not caused by people of colour because we're talking about our oppression, because we're talking about our experiences of racism. I'm not saying that that, uh, and it's not that a, minority women are causing it, but it's a way of thinking and but it's, I don't find it very productive. But based on history and it's based on our experiences. OK, I'm going to stop you just there for that point. DeRay, listening to this, what do you think? I mean, um, is there a sense in which white women in the United States have been let off the hook when it comes to the long history of racism. So I think I, I hear this idea of, of nobody wins when we play the oppression Olympics, right? Like that is just not a winning game. Yeah. Uh, I will say that there is something particularly around whiteness that we just are not honest, that like the history of whiteness is a history of exploitation and domination. And I'm like, I didn't invent that. I'm not like the first person to say that. But when we think about white women specifically, you think about the new research that's come out about white uh, female slave owners, right? That like there is this narrative that white women on plantations were just these passive bystanders while the men were inflicting all this damage. And the new research actually suggests that white women explicitly participated in every facet of the institution of slavery, that they were like intimately involved in the persecution of people. They were intimately involved in the perpetuation and the defense of the institution. So there is something about naming the history. Uh, and it is this idea of not letting people off the hook in the way we tell the historical record. And when we talk about Trump, I mean, let's be clear, 53% of white women voted for him. And that is not something that we ignore, right? That that happened. And there is something about being honest. When we talk about truth and reconciliation, we are reminded that the truth has to come before the reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people that want to do all this reconciliation work without dealing with the truth first. OK, I'm going to go final word to uh, Lionel since you started us off. Um, well, I, you know, I agree with all that, right? <laughs> and, there we go. Stop it. And actually, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but since that last question was... And, and, and I'm, I'm always glad of points of, of agreement. We are living in a time of unnecessary polarization and actually one of the things I've enjoyed about this particular panel is that it's been uh, collegial I think yes. and I find that refreshing. Perfect place for us to leave this particular <laughs> panel. Uh, that's all we have time for a little over time in fact thanks to our panel Steve Cole, Benjamin Law, Lionel Shriver, DeRay McKesson and Ruby Hamad. Thank you very much. You can continue the discussion on Facebook.
and Twitter. Make sure it stays collegial. Uh, next week on Q&A, WA Green Senator and passionate disability advocate Jordan Steele-John. The Australian's foreign editor, Greg Sheridan. ACT Liberal Senator Zed Seselja. Uh, WA Labor MP Anne Alley and the Grattan Institute's Daniel Wood. Before we go, last week I speculated that the audience for Sky News After Dark was perhaps 5,000. I asked Sky to fact-check that and, of course, they did. Uh, so they claim that more than 60,000 viewers tune in at night, so I hereby turn over the issue to any other interested fact-checkers. Until next Monday, good night. Thank <laughs> you.